Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Michael Santuamo, a member of SAC. And I'm Sarah Brown. <laughs> We'd like to welcome you to our second faculty and FOSTIS focus event for the semester. We're so happy to continue and grow the faculty and focus series, largely in part just the support and leadership of the provost's office. Um, as you may know, faculty and focus is a series uh, co-sponsored by the office of the provost and the president staff advisory council. It was launched in the fall of 2017 and designed to cultivate community to Brown by offering the opportunity for staff to gather and hear from a member of the Brown faculty about their scholarship. Okay. Um, we are glad to have you joining us today as we extend a very warm welcome to Kent Kleinman, faculty director of the Brown Arts Institute and professor of the practice of history and art and architecture. There will be time for questions after the talk. We again thank the provost's office, Christy, Jay, and Katie, and the provost in particular, for being a great partner on not only this event, but so many events and initiatives during his time at Brown. Our sincerest thanks on behalf of staff. I will now turn it over to Provost Locke to offer some remarks and introduce Kent. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Really nice to see you all. And thanks for being here on this sort of wintry gray day. But this is a bright uh, spot. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael and Sarah, uh, for your partnership, but also for the introduction. Um, and thanks, everyone, for uh, being here uh, for today's, uh, and this is the final faculty and focus lecture for this semester. There'll be many more to come uh, next semester. And I guess I want to um, begin by, first of all, and perhaps the most important thing I would say is just to really thank you uh, for uh, all the work that you do every single day, day in, day out, to make this university the great university that it is. Uh, without your work, uh, we wouldn't be able to do the great research, teaching, outreach uh, that uh, we do. Um, we probably don't say it enough, but I hope that you genuinely feel uh, the sincere thanks coming from me. Uh, and from others who, as faculty, happen to be serving uh, in these leadership roles uh, these uh, these days. It's been a tremendous uh, privilege for me to be able to work with you. So thank you uh, for that. And, you know, the success of these kinds of events don't happen on their own, as you well know. Uh, they happen with, you know, the kind of the participation and curiosity and willingness uh, to learn from one another. And that's what's so great about these kinds of events that we actually, I mean, for me, when this university really sings is when we come together and it doesn't matter who you are, like we we're part of this kind of academic community and we're here because we're kind of curious and we think education's a good thing and um and we want to learn and when we actually get together and cut through everything else and focus on that that's when this place sings uh and so uh thank you Ken for giving us an opportunity to once together together uh come together and, and do this let me just say a few words about uh Kent uh and then I'll turn it over to him uh, so, uh, as was mentioned, Kent um, is the uh, uh, faculty director of the Brown Arts Institute, and we were able to successfully recruit him away from uh, RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, uh, last uh, spring, where he served as uh, provost. Uh, and I have been serving as provost for seven and a half years. I think I worked with maybe four provosts in that period um, uh, from uh, uh, from uh, RISD. Kent and, and the other people were really wonderful and nice, but um, there was this project that we had, and the project was how could we actually create a new program that blended together engineering and design? Uh, that's a big thing these days, design, and uh, especially if you could have technical uh, work with uh, design. And uh, Brown has very strong arts, very strong uh, uh, engineering, uh, but we're next door to one of the country's great arts and design schools. So the idea is let's partner. Uh, and everyone thought it was a great idea, but we could never get it done. And then Kent arrived uh, and literally we got it done really fast because not only did he see the vision and he has incredible experience professionally uh, to do these things, 
but was able to, again, cut through and say, like, this is an important thing for us to do. And we were able to do it. And I think uh, the program is really one of the things that we can be really, really proud of because it's distinctive, right? That you bring technical knowledge with uh, creative uh, uh, insights. Uh, and that's what the world needs in industry, in academia, uh, in healthcare, uh, et cetera. Um, and he's been a terrific partner, not just in that new program, but of course, the Brown RISD uh, uh, dual degree program that we have is really amazing. Before coming to RISD, uh, uh, Kent uh, was the Dean of the College of Architecture, Art and Planning uh, at Cornell. Uh, the provost uh, at Cornell had written me about Kent and said, you know, here's this real gem of a person, uh, you know, you should get to know him, and, uh, and he was right. And then before he was at Cornell, Kent uh, was a faculty member at the Parsons School of Design, uh, the State University of New York in Buffalo, the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. Um, he has um, an international reputation, has uh, worked uh, at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, the Hochschule der Kunst in Berlin, uh, the Royal Academy in Copenhagen, and ETH uh, in uh, Zurich. Uh, he told me when we first met, um, maybe when we first met more socially than uh, professionally, uh, that um, he spent a lot of his uh, childhood in Germany. Uh, his mother being a opera uh, singer. So it's just like quintessential Brown, you know, this sort of like someone who has the academic chops, but quite creative, global and in, uh, in sort of uh, perspective uh, and background. And what I always say what's amazing about Brown is that we recruit um, out of the box creative thinkers who want to make a difference in the world. That's like our niche in the academic ecosystem. And we stay true to that. That's when we really do great uh, things. Um, Kent received his bachelor's and master's degrees uh, from the University of California and, and Berkeley. Uh, he has won numerous awards from the Mellon Foundation, the Graham Foundation, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, and he was uh, named by the Design Intelligence Organization. Kent uh, was twice named among the top 25 most admired educators. Uh, and um, was also uh, his one of his books was named a top 10 book of the year uh, wow. in architecture. So please uh, bless you. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Kent and we look forward to learning from you today. Thank you. My notes here. Well, um, I didn't recognize that person you just described, but he sounds pretty amazing. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank, th thank you, uh, Provost Locke. That is extremely generous and, and personal, uh, as, as you always do. Uh, introduction, appreciate that very much. Um, th thank you, uh, Brown staff. I've been here only a brief amount of time, and um, I've given very few talks, and I am truly honored and really, really feel uh, grateful that uh, one of my first talks is to the staff. Um, I, I've, I've been in leadership positions and administrative positions for a good part of my academic career, and I, I know the role that you play, and I want to reiterate, even though I'm new to Brown, I haven't seen you in action, and, and I hope to get to know you better, but um, the, the important work that the staff does is, is so vital to the academic mission, and uh, it's really an honor to be asked to speak to you. So thank you also for inviting me to do this. Um, I want to talk a little bit today about um, art as research, and, and it's a title that's uh, the language of which is quite particular. You're going to um, hear me uh, speaking about the term research a, a lot because I actually think that art making and, and, and work in the creative disciplines is indeed a form of knowledge production, and it, it's a form of research as well. Um, but it has a particular kind of valence, let's say, in, in, in art making and in design work. And I want to try to tease that out a little bit and provide a framework for what research might mean um, in that category. Um, I, I do want to mention that um, uh, there are two directors for the um, Brown Arts Institute, and you're probably aware of this. I'm the faculty director, but we have an artistic director, Avery Willis Hoffman. And you've probably seen um, some of the extraordinary work that's going on around Granoff and the, the Lindemann uh, Performing Arts Center. 
And um, this is a huge amount of work and a really fantastic amount of energy happening uh, in that quarter. So I also I don't know if Avi's here today, but I wanted to recognize her, you know, her central role to, to the Institute. And while I'm at it, I want to also say hello to Kira, who's uh, very kindly uh, joining us. And Kira's, Kira's my boss. <laughs> 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 so, so let me get let me get started. Art as research. Um, first of all, uh, I want to keep my own uh, academic biography brief, not because I'm not proud of it, but because I want to move into a slightly different direction. But I, I did uh, publish books, and and I'm trained as an architect, but got into the kind of uh, scholarship around and with architecture, and so I'm I'm very comfortable with and understand the value with, and never want to devalue the importance of of scholarship on the arts. And a lot of my academic career was dedicated to that. And as you can see, these are four of, of uh, five or six that I've published. Uh, what they have in common, what you can't see, is, is a sort of critical lens on the modern project. Uh, what uh, Growing up in Germany, I was surrounded by a country that rebuilt itself after the World War. And, and modernity was, was very much in the kind of uh, cultural milieu of, of Europe at that time. Um, and my project was to try to find cracks in what was presented as a very homogeneous and very um, sort of universal Universal project, um, and I was seeing lots of examples of where that that, that definition, that description, didn't apply. Uh, project architects, artists who were working in what was termed loosely modernity, uh, but when you get down under the surface, you can find all sorts of sort of alternative uh, subtext in the work, and I was very fascinated by that. So these books um, have that in common. I also want to uh, put this slide in there just to remind me to tell you that um, I'm extremely faculty centric. Um, I, I do believe that the, the the heart and soul of a great university is the is the faculty and anything that one can do to support the faculty uh, accrues to the to the larger benefit of the institution. And I put this in there just to show that um, a lot of the work that I did was indirect, uh, helping faculty do their work, uh, which I found to be uh, very very rewarding and 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 very creative as well. And setting up things like labs, and these are all, you know, labs is a term you might associate with STEM disciplines, with science disciplines, so very intentionally using the word lab for these faculty who are working in the most creative uh, modalities you can imagine, I won't, I won't go through them individually, but top left there, Jenny Sabin does digital knitting and she's trained as a ceramicist. Um, and, um, you know, this, this gentleman here, uh, Sasha Sitskovich, um, works with um, hardware and software, um, trying to optimize the use of lumber and his, his tool of choice is his um, brush, if you will, is a robot with a chainsaw at the end of it that he programs to cut things up. And, you know, it's quite balletic. Uh, it's also a little intimidating. So I, I put this in only to say that, that labs, yes, research, yes, supporting faculty, yes, but the modality of the work is, is remarkably diverse and creative and has a kind of material, material presence in it as well. And I also wanted to put this slide in there, that there is a mode of research which is about art making. It's about artworks. So research on art. And that spans the entire spectrum from scholarship, tech-based scholarship, to the most sophisticated kind of STEM technologies that, that one can get hold of. And I was involved a little peripherally, but I was involved in this project, which represents one of those, one of those sort of uh, um, extremes. If you happen to have a, a, a synchrotron and, and at Cornell, it's called CHESS, right? the CHESS High Energy Synchrotron Source. If you happen to have one of those under your playing field and you happen to have access to uh, Garrett Dow, who's a 17th century um, Dutch master from the Leiden collection, and you happen to be able to get those two things together, kind of pretty amazing things can happen, even though the people who are making these amazing things happen don't consider themselves artists or designers, but they're really, um, in this case, it was uh, chemist and a material scientist, but we were able to put a DAO, a small, small oil panel, um, in, the, in the path of a high energy particle beam, an x-ray beam, and you can imagine what happens when it hits different kinds of pigment. The pigments have metals in them, so if it has, um, you know, uh, if it's white, it has lead, the scatter pattern, the mapping pattern can be distinguished from, let's say, iron, which is more of the kind of earth colors, and you can produce the, these maps of underpaintings that you can't see with the eye. And you, as a scholar, then you can make a sort of uh, uh, deductions and, and, and inferences about how the artists work and how these paintings might be read when you can see the process by which they were, they were built. And so on this slide, you can see there's the painting on the left, the Garrett Dow, there's the synchrotron under the playing fields, and then on the bottom there, you can see 
the painting on a screen and one of the one of the maps on the screen as well. And I'll show you that more closely here. So this is just one of the maps. This is the iron map. And you can see that under this painting, which has the curtain on the right and a cat in the foreground, and you can't see much else in the underpainting, in this case, iron, you can see that the curtain was on the left. There actually is a figure behind the curtain. There's a violin, there's a globe. And there's then the, the interpretation starts to emerge that this painting is really about sensibilities and the human body and the vision and audible part of, of, of sensation. So a different set of interpretations start to become um, um, available to scholars using this kind of technology. So this research on artworks, I think, is a very important category. And Brown has certain assets that Cornell doesn't have and vice versa. And it's always somewhat opportunistic. It's right, you know, how can you bring people together around an interesting research question and discover new things about, about artwork? Um, but I want to switch the lens or refocus it a little bit, not so much on research on art, but art as research, the, the literal material practice or the performative practice of art making and design making put the two together um, as a form of knowledge production, right? Uh, asking tough questions about the world um, through making, through actual art production, coming to some different understanding about the world because you made something. And uh, the example that I use, it's a quirky one, so bear with me. Um, and it does have to do with my time in Vienna, but um, you might be familiar with the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, who uh, is uh, an interesting uh, philosopher in that he had two rather distinct chapters to his, to his thinking, to his philosophy. The first, um, during a period when he went to uh, Trinity College to Cambridge and worked with Bertrand Russell and produced this important book called the Tractatus uh, Logico Philosophicus, um, a, a book uh, of principles, quasi mathematical, symbolic logic, very much in, in the Russell kind of way of thinking about the world, abstract, general, um, symbolic. Uh, hovering above the mundane and the particular and trying to, as, as Wittgenstein actually said, solve essentially all the important questions of philosophy. That's the way he described this, this project. And this was his doctoral dissertation and it was accepted and that was Wittgenstein. Uh, late Wittgenstein, actually it was the, the, the Philosophical Investigations was published after he died. He died in, in 51. Um, in a completely different animal. It's a very uh, particular look at the world through language and language games. Everything is contextualized. The use of expressions are contextualized by their position within a sentence, within a kind of a kind of logic of language. Um, always very, very particular. You know, lots of pages about the use of the term red and how it becomes inflected by its neighboring terminology and so forth. Two different philosophies. And the question is, what happened to this guy? Like, he was one thing when he was young, another thing when he died. What happened to this guy? And I mean this only slightly facetiously because it's probably an exaggeration, but one of the things that happened to him in 1928-ish was he dabbled in architecture. Um, he actually dabbled so much that he called himself an architect. He signed the plans for a building that he worked on. It was the um, house for his sister, a uh, big house in Vienna. And you can see his signature there um, in the middle, the Ludwig Wittgenstein architect. And so my hypothesis is probably slightly, slightly wrong, but not entirely so, is that the material experience of working as an architect actually had something to do with this change in his way of thinking about the world. So there was an epistemological transformation of pivot um, and architecture was sort of at the pivot point. And I found uh, an extraordinary book by a very unknown uh, architect, Jan Tarnowski, is a, a Czech immigrant. And um, you can see it there on the left, there's the, the, the poetics of a wall projection. And I should say, you know, a Mauervorsprung in German, it's not a real word. So you know, it took me six months to realize I couldn't translate this word because it's not a word. Um, it's a wall, a wall that projects, or, or it's a projection, or it's not entirely clear. In German has many sort of inflections. So my pathetic title is, you know, Poetics, Poetics of the Wall Projection, but I translated this book and got to know Jan and translated this book. And, and here's what uh, Tarnowski discovered. And it's, it's kind of beautiful, I think. So on, on the left, you see the, the, the Villa Stronberg. This is the villa that Wittgenstein Ludwig was working on for his sister. And you can see up a little circle around that window. On the right, you see a line drawing of the plan. It's a simple breakfast room and it has a simple entry vestibule. And you can see those dotted lines. Wittgenstein wanted to do something so banal, so self-evident. You know, we've all done this all the time, maybe not in a building, but we've done this in our lives. He wanted to bring order, formal order to this configuration by centering, in this case, windows on the breakfast room 
from the outside and the inside. That's all he wanted to do. He, he just written this whole book about solving the most essential problems of philosophy through symbolic logic. Surely he could center a window on the inside and the outside, right? Not so easy, right? <laughs> you could do it in a line drawing, but as soon as gravity enters the situation, as soon as walls get thickness and weight and material presence, right? It's actually not so easy. So he struggled with it. And on the left is Tarnovsky, on the right is Wittgenstein. You can see that you can try to make a thin wall and no, it doesn't quite work that way. Then in the middle, you can make two thick walls, right? And it still doesn't quite work. And then in the bottom, you can actually do it. You can center the window in both situations, but only if you do the Ill illogical thing of building two buildings. Right? You literally have to build a building for the breakfast room and center the window, and then you build the building for the entry vestibule and center the door. Um, and of course, Wittgenstein didn't want to do the illogical thing, so he built what you see on the right, which is a stubby little projecting wall, which is simulating a thick wall as if it were two buildings, but he didn't want to actually build two buildings, so he just simulated it. And of course, all this does when you walk into the room is it shows he couldn't solve the problem. He couldn't solve the problem. And the lesson here, at least for me and for Tarnowski, was that um, the engagement of the particular, of the material, of gravity, of makerly substance, right, embodiedness per se, actually changes your ability to operate and think about the order of things. Um, and whether or not this caused Wittgenstein to change his entire philosophical outlook is pure speculation on my part, but it's pretty to think that architecture could have this uh, role in, 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 in a major uh, uh, life of a philosopher. So I want to continue on that, that path of material engagement. So this is another artist that I admire greatly. You've probably heard of William Kentridge, or you may have heard of William Kentridge. Uh, this is a drawing that he did uh, in uh, 2007. It's called Parcours d'Atelier. Uh, you know, parkour is a kind of sports or a course of some kind. So it's, you know, it's already the sense the atelier is not a place where you think and then you're inspired and you make a mark. Right? That's the 19th century view of it, but rather it's a kind of obstacle course or it's an exercise course. It's a physical engagement. And you may find this hard to believe, but this is a drawing, a diagram of William Kentridge working on a stop motion animation. And those of you who know stop motion animation, there is nothing more precise, more persnickety, more detailed than stop motion animation. Right? You, you take a picture and then you go over make a little change and you go back and you take the picture and you go back and you can see by the way I'm moving, right? It's a completely linear process, right? Nothing is more linear than stop motion animation. And this is his drawing of his process of doing that. So the square in the middle is his camera and the, the rectangle on the right is the artwork, the drawing that he's working. He works a lot in charcoal. And uh, you, know, you can see for yourself, it's not linear. Right. And and arguably it's not linear, not because he was a procrastinator or because he didn't know how to do this, uh, because he's a master at this. It's not linear because it's not linear uh, that the act of actually making the moves, the changes to the drawing is not a linear process of thought. Right. I have a thought and I make the mark. It's an act of discovery. It's an act of discovery. It's a kind of exercise in discovery. And as you can see from this quote from a book that I enjoy very much by Leora Maltz Lecker, who's a art historian at RISD, um, is she is actually proposing that um, drawing is not about thought at all, right? that drawing is about the unthought. And what you're doing when you're drawing is drawing out that which is hidden. Right? You're actually exposing, discovering, excavating, uh, the world in a way that you had not thought of before. Right? The thought is somehow occluded and hidden and drawing allows it to be uncovered. It's a kind of exercise in discovering the unknown. Um, and I think this, this, uh, this drawing really summarizes that quite beautifully and with a fair amount of wit as well. And I recommend this book to you uh, highly if, you, if you're interested in, in William Kentridge. So pursuing the same line of thought, I want to introduce you to Joseph Albers, who many of you may know, um, a German emigre who came to the United States in the 30s, uh, lived in Cambridge, worked at Yale, and is well known for these, these set of paintings that involve uh, the use of color and the perception of color in a certain context. And this is a very important body of work. He calls them experiments, uh, these homages to squares, call them experiments using a kind of scientific language, a research language. 
And um, he did about 2,000 of them. So he did a lot of them. So it has a kind of recurring, iterative kind of verification sense to it. And what he would do is use paint directly off an acrylic, directly out of the tube. So this wasn't a kind of painterly um, connoisseurship project at all. But it was straight out of the tube, often with a palette knife on a board. Uh, scrape it on and put the green, the blue, the gray, the blue, the green, the gray, slightly different colors, slightly different proportions, and see what happens at the at the um, interface between these colors and how new color conditions and and depth perceptions are produced simply by bringing colors into close proximity with one another. Very, very uh, rigorous series of, of paintings. You can see on the on the, on the left, you can see that 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 kind of ochre square looks to have a different hue depending on the neighboring color. So that's that's the example. You've probably seen these kind of things before. And this one's at RISD, so not, not to say too much about RISD, but you, know, you walk down the hill once in a while, it's worth your time. They have a great cafe and they have this painting there as as well. And and Albus was quite, um, you know, again, this, this question of modernity and its homogeneity, Albus was quite important because he was saying, you think that this industrial paint coming from a tube applied with a palette knife is, is the same everywhere, but it actually inflects based on subjectivity, right? The way that the observer perceives this work changes its depth, changes its, its kind of coloration. Um, and this was quite an interesting inflection of the modern project where it, it actually was um, based on uh, context, right? that the context of a color would actually uh, change your perception of it. Um, but it is worth saying, I think, that the Alba subject, even though it was a kind of subjective perceiving entity, was a historical. Right? There, there was there, it wasn't like subjects in Germany versus subjects in South America, right? It was subjects. Universal subjects would have this universal experience if you brought these colors together. A historical, a temporal, a political. Right? The, the entire kind of particularity of observing subjects was washed out, and you had this kind of proposition about color proximity. I want to compare and contrast, more contrast, that with this. This is someone um, who happens to be an architect. It's just a coincidence. Um, went to Cornell. Just a coincidence. Um, Amanda Williams works out of Chicago. He's a very uh, uh, well-known artist now. Just uh, uh, became a uh, MacArthur Fellow this year. Um, and she uh, was trained on Alba. She knows her Alba. She knows it well. I, I know that for a fact. And um, she took Albers to a different place. And she said, here's my color palette. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a color palette just like Albers. Here's my color palette. But my color palette is massively inflected and affected by context, social context, racial context, cultural context, temporal context, urban context, economic context. All those factors are playing into color. Color can't be used abstractly the way Albert was pr pr proposing. And so you can see those are her, that's her color palette. You can see her quote there above it as well. Uh, this project's from 2015. And you can see where she picks her colors from. Right? I mean, many of you will, will recognize these products. She actually went into the kind of um, commerce of, of the neighborhood in which she was working and identified hues that are associated with certain kind of lifestyles and products and so forth. So you can see two examples here. And then she took those colors and painted parts of the city, those colors. Uh, in this case, abandoned houses in, in, in um, South Chicago. Um, not one, but many, um, a whole series of these. And she involved the community. Right? So the entire community was involved in re painting, recoloring, recodifying a part of the urban structure to bring it into this discourse about economics, urban security, um, um, environmental uh, justice, uh, racial issues as well. So really, really uh, beautiful, beautiful body of work, leaning on Albers, but you can see how this, this becomes now a kind of different understanding of what subjectivity is. And I consider this to be art as research. Right? It's actually the making of it. When you see the people out there with the body, actually the making of it constitutes the work. So let me uh, keep on that track. So not only pigments, right? not only people with brushes, but now pushing it a little bit further, things themselves have agency. So if you're arguing that art constitutes a way of knowing the world, I'm now arguing that not only the artists, but the things themselves in the world can have a kind of social agency. Well. Here's an example, again, a little bit of a coincidence. Um, when I was at Cornell, I got to know a gentleman named Ratan Tata. And those of you familiar with um, things in India probably know the name Tata. Tata 
is a, 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 a corporation of many, many dimensions, um, everything from salt, cell phones, hydroelectric trains, trucks, Tata Industries do all that. Also one of the largest charities in the world. And Ratan Tata was both. He was chairman of the corporation and also chairman of the holding company. And um, I, I, when I got to know him in 2008, nine, um, he had this um, extraordinary idea good or bad, I leave to you. Extraordinary idea of introducing an automobile to India, and we're talking almost a billion people, right? To address the precarity of urban life when people were in transit. And if you've been to Mumbai, you've been to Delhi, you've been to Calcutta, you might know what I'm talking about. You know, the moped with a family of six on it. Um, you know, he wanted to he wanted to provide a vehicle that would allow people to move safely to to, to the cities and to the country. And he called that that car uh, a nano, a nano, and we uh, were able to get hold of of a nano and do research on it uh, as 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 a, as a as a college and as an institution. The way the project started was, he uh, uh, asked his designers to come up with a vehicle that would cost one lakh rupees. One lakh rupees is a hundred thousand uh, rupees. And that's roughly at the time was about two thousand two hundred dollars. So he was the charge to his designers was you know impossible. Right? You can't design a full fledged car for the price of a, of a small laptop. Two thousand two hundred dollars, um, a full car, right? Seat belts, four wheels, headlights, horn, the works, the windows, everything. And his engineers came up with this. They said, "Well, what? How can we do this? We, uh, let's go to the marketplace. Well, a scooter costs about half a lakh rupees, about fifty thousand rupees. So let's put two scooters together, put a little canvas roof on it, and and you know we're done. And so this is this is the prototype of the Tata Nano, uh, which we also got hold of, which I think is you know extraordinary in its own way. Uh, but this is the actual the actual car, um, and by by any definition, it's it's an extraordinary accomplishment. I mean, nobody in in, in any other uh, industrialized nation has come close to producing a, a, a product of this uh, capacity and complexity for that price. Uh, you know, and and he, he was selling it for for uh, one lakh rupees. So we got a, we got hold of this car and we did an exhibition about it. And again, you can imagine the goods and the bads, the positives and the negatives are just floating you know, around because every time you say this is an amazing design accomplishment, you say this is going to kill the world, right? I mean, if you have 750 million people driving a, a fossil fuel powered vehicle, not, not a great thing. On the other hand, you have safety for the masses and who are we in the United States to say that's not a desirable thing when we all have that ourselves. So lots of conflicting conversations. Um, we did an exhibition, we tried to capture the complexity. We tried to contextualize the object and capture that complexity. So just um, from a design exhibition design perspective, the one lakh rupees was uh, presented not just as a number, an abstract number, it was presented in terms of what would that buy you in India then, depending on who you were. So your socio uh, economic status, if you were a security guard, or if you were a computer software designer, or if you were a, uh, a train uh, conductor, uh, how much would you earn? And then what would a lakh rupees mean? How many bags of rice? How many, you know, use mopeds? How many cell phones and so forth? So that research was all done and displayed quite clearly. And then on the other hand, the kind of technical innovation that this object represented was also conveyed quite clearly. Um, weight became a major, how many pieces, you know, if you could shave off a piece here or there and cut the weight a little bit, you could make a smaller motor and you could save on, on the cost of the car. So all that information we tried to capture in the show. And we did this. Um, so this is the one I want to show you. So this is, um, what does it mean to introduce automobility at this scale to a culture? I mean, how do you even start to understand that question? And so we had a very daring student, Jeremy Siegel, who um, took it upon himself to spend a couple of months, uh, mostly in Mumbai. It's all of these are, that I'm going to show you are in Mumbai. And he tried to parse out what it might mean from a cultural perspective, and particularly an urban cultural perspective, to shift from the existing modes of, of, of movement to something like a nano. So what you're seeing is, is a kind of ethnography, right? This is an ethnography of a kilometer. This is a, like the cultural meaning of distance. So here's um, a foot. Here's a kilometer on a bullet cart. Auto 
rickshaw. I've never seen these before. Train. And if you watch these, occasionally you'll see someone waving or saying hello. So, only to say, you have your own uh, impressions, I'm sure, only to say that to understand a, 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 a piece of design, especially something of this magnitude, means to engage it in its multiple dimensions and contextualize it as an embodied kind of object. It has profound implications for the way culture unfolds. Uh, unfolds. Uh, in addition to the videos, um, we, of course, took the climate impact seriously. And so we made, instead of a poster, we made a giant sphere. Um, you can see that sphere there. That sphere is housed in an outdoor atrium that's part of the Johnson Museum. The sphere represents the CO2 emissions from the nano. And it just so happens we calculated out the volume of the atrium was roughly the annual C CO2 output of America's favorite vehicle at the time. Guess what it is? You probably know. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you compare the Ford 150 to a nano, you have another kind of global debate going on. And of course, uh, we invited scholars to come and, and think about the nano. This is Arjuna Padurai, who wrote an extremely important book, highly recommend to you, Social Life of Things, written in um, 1985. And he then uh, wrote a book for us on the nano, on the exhibition and so forth. And I just wanted to uh, pull out this one quote, in its capacity to make demands rather than fulfill needs. You know, this is now a thing making demands, right? So this is now agency. Uh, the nano behaves less like a simple commodity and more like a social agent. And this is important. So none of this work that we were doing in this particular car, right, 2,000 pound car, uh, no, not 2,000 pound, 1,000 pound car, um, could have been done by a single discipline. You couldn't do this kind of work just within some disciplinary silo. You needed a whole bunch of expertise universities are great and strongest when you work across these silos. And so this is a list of the entities at Cornell that made this project possible and gave it its depth and significance. Any, any single one of them on its own would have been good, but would have been missing all the others. And you can see that it crosses all the traditional boundaries, right? You have economists, you have scientists, you have traffic engineers, you have landscape architects, designers, artists, you know, you need them all to do this kind of work. And I do call this a kind of research uh, project, a research group um, for this kind of work. So talking about social, social uh, talking about climate change, I cannot not talk about climate change, so please forgive me, but I do want to continue this line of thinking where um, working on climate change through the arts um, is both possible and doable, but most importantly, it's not only about climate change, it's also a social project. And I just want to um, share this quote and then share a paper with you. Um, Bruno Latour, the philosopher who died recently, um, um, tragically for, from my perspective, um, wrote a lot about the position of technology in contemporary um, um, theories of, of knowledge and being. Um, and one of his most powerful insights and statements was exactly this, that uh, until recently, we thought of the world as divided between uh, matters of concern and matters of fact. And so when you walked outside and it was raining, you said, it's raining, you know. <laughs> but if you put on a black turtleneck, you say, you know, I don't like your black turtleneck. It's a matter of concern, right? You have some choice over it. So the world was divided into these two rough categories, you know, things that you have choice over and, and decision-making policy over and things that you don't, matters of fact. And, and what he said, and it's quite obvious, I think, to, to almost everybody, um, that at least in climate dialogue, matters that used to be of fact are now matters of concern. In other words, we are, we are responsible for the rain that comes down. Right? We're responsible for the heat that we experience. We're responsible for the, for the blizzards and the tornadoes and, and the consequences of those things. If those things have shifted into matters of concern. And from my perspective, the rhetoric that I use is they become designed objects. So the climate is, is a kind of design condition, right? It's not just out there, it's in here. It's a, we're responsible for it. And uh, I just wanna share this, this, you probably have your own papers that you go to to sort of get make sense of the, the, the enormous amount of information from the scientific community 
on climate change, but I did want to share this with you because this is this uh, affirms for me the statement that uh, climate change is, is a, an environmental justice is also a social justice project. In fact, maybe even primarily a social justice project. So this is um, a paper by by uh, Professor Xu in, in Nanjing University and and four other authors. And it's a very beautiful hypothesis. They, they did some research over the last six millennia, and they said, you know, by and large, some exceptions, by and large, if you look where the human species has settled, it's settled in a band, and that band has a certain climate profile to it. And the climate profile is 13 to 15 degrees C. Right? So if 13 degrees, 20, that's where most people have settled historically. If you now apply the most sophisticated climate models and project forward, they're projecting the 2070s, so about 50 years, uh, what happens to the band? Well, great question. And in fact, you can project what happens and it moves northwards, it moves. And then the next question is, well, what does that mean? And what it means, of course, is that for six millennia, people have settled in that band, that band moves, and now you've got a bunch of people who are no longer in the climate band. That's what these maps show. From a design perspective, it's not so clear. Fortunately, he got a graphic person involved and they produced this map, which I think is very clear. Uh, this is the heat map, right? So this shows the exact same argument now uh, in a very clear way where it's red and redder. Those are the areas that have shifted from habitable to less habitable, most extreme, and where it's green or greener are areas that were previously less habitable and they've moved more habitable. So this maps out in green and red um, habitability based on climate, right? based on climate. And what the authors have said, and they're not trying to be deterministic about this, is that anywhere between 1.5 and 3 billion people, that's a B, uh, have moved out of the habitable climate band. 1.5 to 3 billion people. Will they all migrate? No, right? Some, you can see where the reds are, Venezuela, Brazil, uh, the, the South uh, Sahel, you know, the area uh, south of the Sahara Desert, uh, much of Pakistan, much of India, um, a lot of Malaysia, no north part of Australia. You can see where the red parts are. Um, some of those uh, economies, some of those states have the ability to mitigate uh, to some degree or others, others less so. Right, others less so. So nobody, I don't believe, knows with an enormous amount of certainty exactly where the migrations and what quantity of migrations. But we're talking about a massive shift uh, in human habitation. And it's not a stretch to say that the poor among us human beings are going to feel these effects disproportionately large. And this is why I think that climate change is a project for all disciplines, the arts and design, including, and artists agree. Um, so there's a growing body of artwork that's dedicated to precisely this topic. Uh, and I just want to show you two that, sp that span the kind of uh, the, the sort of awe sublime spectrum to the small, but God, I can't get out of my head spectrum, at least for me. Uh, this is in the sublime spectrum. Oliver Eliasson, you might know the artist's work. He's quite well known. He's, his studio is in Berlin, uh, but he's, he's Scandinavian. And he did this installation in 2003 at the Tate Modern Turbine Hall, which is a vast, vast space. It was designed for moving um, um, large generators. And uh, you can see there on the list of, uh, list of materials, he manipulated the light, he manipulated the quality of the air, he manipulated the temperature, and he produced this, this kind of um, um, obsessively hot uh, environment, this kind of uh, um, simulated sun right, that you couldn't escape. And many, many people who went to go see the show simply lied, lay down on the floor, right? And, and just sort of were in, in, sort of in awe of the kind of uh, um, the all overness of this installation. It was really, I, I did get a chance to see this and it was really, um, it falls in the category where it takes your breath away and you're speechless you know, until you can leave it. So there is this kind of work and Arthur Eliasson is a very, very strong representative of it. But I also wanted to share this uh, artist with you who works at the other spectrum, um, tiny, tiny little things. These are little tiny clouds that he works in, his, his metier is clouds. Um, and the lifespan of, of a cloud, this has been out Schmilder, the life cloud, uh, lifespan of a cloud is about a second, maybe two if you're lucky. Um, and and Smilder goes around to various places that will commission his work and he'll build you a cloud. Um, and, uh, and, and I have to say, you know, it's pretty 
cool being involved in building a cloud. Um, and you get to know some of the science behind sort of weather patterns and so forth. And so we did this. We had a group of students working with him uh, to get the, the humidity just right, the right number of bodies. You couldn't have too many bodies in space because the heat would change the dynamics. A little bit of wind, um, and then he'd release um, some humidity into the air. And his work really is the photograph, right? The photograph is the way he earns his living. Um, and they have a lifespan, like I said, very, very, very briefly. So uh, for me, this spectrum of work is, is very, very sort of important and both leave, uh, uh, um, for me at least, a, ma a massive impact. And now I'm putting on my design hat a little bit because I just want to show you how some of this climate change work has made its way into the profession. So professional designers and artists are working on these topics. Um, and, and how it might actually be used using technology, how it might be used to affect change. And this is just one example. There are many, but this is um, uh, Sazaki uh, Associates. You might be familiar with a large engineering firm based in, in Boston. Um, in 2014, they opened up a research arm. And this is also an interesting development where, where firms, uh, not just universities, but now firms have research units within the firms. They give their staff uh, time off to do research in the arts and design and produce projects like this. So this was produced by employees of Sasaki, but working in a, in a kind of research um, um, context. And they uh, did something similar to the climate map. They projected uh, seawater levels um, in both a um, future situation. So you see on the left, the sea level in 2015, 2050, and then sea level in, in, with a surge of a storm. Right? So you could compare these two things over two different time frames. And what was quite uh, beautiful about this is not just the idea of having this kind of um, uh, interactive map, but you could enter in your address and see what would happen to your house if you happen to live in one of the neighborhoods. Nothing gets your attention more than when it affects your very ground that you're standing on. And they put these screens in bars and pubs and sort of public spaces so that people could really interact and start to understand that there's no escaping these consequences. You can ignore them, but you can't escape them. So very, a very sort of um, uh, potent way of getting it into the public bloodstream. And, and schools of design are dealing with these subjects, I think, also in very, very uh, inventive and creative ways. And I just wanted to show you this recent project from RISD. This is um, a department that's very interesting. You should keep your eye on them. It's called Interior Architecture, but it's really um, an adaptive reuse uh, graduate program. And they look at questions of how do you reuse uh, investments that were made in the environment and how do you prepare for a future which will cause different uh, habitation settlement patterns. And this is a project in, in, uh, in Newport, Point, Point Community in Newport, where they did just that. They, they took their existing condition, they projected forward multiple years, they tried to map what part of that community would be on the water at what point, but then they tried to proactively project a different way of inhabiting the earth that would take advantage of dry versus wet or occasionally dry and sometimes wet and so forth. So you can see those those sections um, on the top and the plans on the bottom where the where the, the blue the blue field expands and contracts um, and you access your house and so forth and, and live communally uh, with the water instead of trying to just keep it out with it with a dike or something. So it's a very uh, creative project. But this is really where I think they're, they're, they're going next. And you, I think you're going to see more of this kind of work um, using some of the very sophisticated technology that is not coming out of design schools, coming out of engineering and computer science schools, using some of the virtual reality technology to bring these projections to the community. And so what, what they've done is they've set up booths, they've gone into people's houses, they've set up little tents, they have community dinners, and they're bringing uh, VR goggles or augmented reality facilities, you can just do it with a, with a, with a, with a cell phone, um, and saying, put on these goggles, you know, we'll make sure you're safe, but you want, you want to see what your house is going to look like or your neighborhood's going to look like in 50 years. Here's a model of it, and here's a proposal for it. Uh, as, as well. And what this work is starting to do is to bring the design and, and the creative ability of, of, of artists and designers um, into the policymaking realm, right? That, that one of the reasons why climate change has been so sticky is not that the science isn't there, the science is absolutely clear, um, and not that the value set isn't there. Most people think that, you know, um, climate change is, is something we have to deal with. Um, it's simply moving policy needles. It's been really, really sticky. And, uh, and this work is geared at that. So, so again, you know, kind of creative vision, married with technology, brought into the community, seeding the ground for policy change so that we can maybe inhabit the world in, in, in a different way. 
And I, I want to end with this project. So, um, so that's climate change and multiple iterations. But this is also a project that is about the, the changing habitat, not just the human habitat, but but the the, uh, the the wild animal habitat as well, by a very interesting artist named Rachel Berwick, happens to also be a, a RISD glassmaker. Um, and this is called Indigo Scroll. And I don't know if you can make out what it is. It's long. It's it's I think 25, 28 feet long, narrow and long. Um, and this is what it is. Um, indigo bunting, you probably know the, the songbird. And what uh, Rachel was fascinated by, uh, among other things, was that even in death, they maintain the color. Right? That the, the wings, the structure, the nanostructure of the wings uh, produces structural color. That's not dependent on a pigment or any kind, anything that'll, that'll um, change color, but it's actually the light is hitting the, the, the structure of the feathers themselves. It's refracting the light in a certain way, regardless of the life of the bird. So that, that color remains a memory of a condition of these birds when they were alive, but now it's uh, frozen in time. And she produced, and this is my last slide, she produced, I think, a very um, powerful work, small work, but very powerful work, um, in which she cast the bodies, actually she 3D scanned the bodies of some of these birds in different configurations, so scanned them, uh, used the scan to do a 3D print, used the 3D print to make a mold, and used the mold to cast some glass, so multiple stages, but the resulting work is this, and what you're looking at is a scanned body of a bird cast in clear uh, uh, glass with a kind of opalescent quality to it. So you can see that gold slumped over it is a bird that's in slumped glass, right? Slumped is where you simply heat the glass and it melts essentially over. So two birds, two representations. The title is Fallout. And I don't know that any, any ornithologists in the room. Uh, thought Fallout, powerful. Thought Fallout is what happens uh, when migrating birds hit a severe weather event storm, uh, they fold their wings and they drop out of the, out of the sky. And they, they, they're not dead, but they just simply hit the, hit the earth and stay uh, still until the weather event has passed. And this is what Rachel's calling out with this work, a small piece of glass, powerful message. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Um, thank you so much for that talk. Um, oh, I think Hi. there's people on Zoom. Sure. Um, very interested if you, if it's appropriate and you wanted to take five minutes to talk about your work now here. And if you see any of this or, you know, any of these questions or topics being enfolded into that. Here at Brown. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you for the question. Um, let me qualify it by say I'll try, but I'm too new to say anything that I would like pinned on me or my colleagues. So, um, but, but I, I will say, and I'm going to echo Rick here. Um, Brown is a special place, and um, I, I've been in a number of institutions, and already in the short time that I've been here, it's just been incredible how. Uh, the doors have been opened and the minds and conversations have been opened across disciplines and silos that in other institutions just don't talk to another. And just in a few months that I've been here, so I've already met with the physical science chairs, I've met with uh, a lot of the art departments, of course. So, um, so I think the ground is incredibly fertile and the level of expertise is really unparalleled. So those two ingredients get my mind going at least that there's nothing I showed today that we couldn't do and do differently and and maybe with even greater impact at Brown because we've got all those those ingredients um my 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 um charge is to work with the faculty so there's there's two tracks and Avery and I have agreed that whenever we go anywhere we want to remind folks that we will always map the artistic onto the faculty and the faculty onto the, the academic onto the artistic so uh, my 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 imagination my hope my belief is that you're going to see artists coming in with incredible practices faculty artists and makers with incredible uh, practices merging on key topics, maybe some of the ones I outlined today, 
and making work, I mean, literally making work and not only, but, and I'm not denigrating this out, but not only writing about, but actually making work physically uh, that can start to bring some of these issues into the consciousness of society in a way that I think the arts can do uniquely. Um, and, and that's why, I'm, why I ended with Rachel's project that it's just a small thing, you know? Um, it's momentous in my, in, in, my, in my feeling, but it's as strong as Oliver Eliasson's Turbine Hall. And so the arts have that capacity, theater, uh, you know, performative arts, temporal arts have that capacity. And so that's what I'd like to help foster, um, but always with faculty. Do you all know these artists? Is this like old hat? Okay. I was worried about that. People at Brown are so damn smart, you know. So, <laughs> but how are you going to know all these things? I'll ask a question. Hey, Ken. Hi. Um, so I'm curious, uh, when I think about these projects like the Nano or Fallout, it makes me wonder what the goal of research is. and if it's like an aesthetic experience or sharing information or sharing knowledge or something. And I'm wondering what your thoughts would be just on artist research and what are there multiple goals of research? How does that, how do these examples kind of change what research is? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and that's, it's a great question. I think I, I, I lean on Kent Ridge here a little bit and Lior a little bit, but um, it's thinking the unthought. It's it's opening up a vision of the world that you were unable to access without the work. Um, so it, it's really very much that Kentridge line of you thought it was linear, you thought you knew what you knew about the world, or maybe it's even the Wittgenstein experience, and then you engage in a material practice, or you engage with a material thing, or a performative thing, and you see the world anew, you see it differently. And I would also add, you see it with more humility. Um, that you lose a little bit of the arrogance when you realize you've been looking at things through a, through a very small lens and somebody else offers up a different view of the world. There's humility that comes with it. And I tend to think we need more of that, um, just society speaking. So that that's that's the short, short answer to that. But I think different um, audiences will receive artworks in different ways. So if you're a practicing artist, the and 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 Beto Echo said this very beautifully that the, a poetic object is one that asks you about how it was made. So, so you engage something and it doesn't let you go. You know, it, it sort of grabs you a little bit and you go back to you say, wait a minute, there's something about that door handle that just is asking me for more attention. And and this is as Wittenstein's downcoming as well, because you know, every corner was like a research project for him. And and so I do think it has that capacity as well that if it's if it's made with a certain kind of um, uh, precision and and and, and uh, craft, uh, that objects can stop you and delay you and and be a kind of friction in your in your seamless navigation of the world. And I think that's a huge benefit. And and again, it depends. It depends on how you're engaging the object. It might grab you, you know, by the throat. Or it might just tug at your tug at your shirt. But I, I think art objects have that, that that ability to do that to, to slow you down, bring some humility, and make you see the world in a different way. And that's you know, if, I think if you ask the scientists, they'd probably say the same about their research. Slightly different modalities. But, yeah. Thank you for the question. Hi, uh, Jill Kimball from Communications. Um, I, I actually wanted to ask you to expand on what you mean by slightly different modalities. I think, you know, when we think about the scientific approach to research, it's, you know, you come up with your hypothesis, you ask a question, and then you set out to answer it. Um, but I think when it comes to art, it, it can be a little bit more nebulous. You're not necessarily setting out to answer a question. You're just kind of seeking things out a little bit more blindly maybe. Um, so I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about how the research process looks different yeah. if you're an artist. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I agree with your characterization and those are, those are non-trivial <laughs> distinctions. Um, and also just the whole um, infrastructure around these various ways of being in the world differ so dramatically from funding structure to... Um, and I do think it's true that most artists are not looking for an answer. Um, I would say, and, I, and and I'm not sure if this is true of most scientists, I suspect it might be, all the artists and designers I know are looking for a better question. Uh, so th they're simply iterating, they're, they're doing that line, that Kentridge line, you know, probably out there, and they're saying, 
oh, now I know what the question was, you know, after six months, now I know what I was asking, you know, so it's a more precise question. And then that question just simply starts the whole wheel going again. And so it's not, it's not about a terminus. It's not about a line. It's not about having an answer. It's really about coming to know our place in the world with more insight, more depth, maybe more precision so that you can ask the question again and again and again. And, and I don't know if scientists think that way. I, uh, some of the ones I know, maybe just be my circle, you know, the ones that are willing to hang out with me, um, they do think that way, right? That, that scientists are always, we're all seeking the truth, but we think we get at it by asking better and better questions. And I think a, a lot of sort of STEM disciplines engage in exactly that kind of research. So I think there, there are sort of um, um, epistemic similarities, although, like I said, the way you do it, you know, it's like if you're, if I, I had a picture in here, I should have included it, but I deleted it. You would may have liked it. There's two pictures of, there's two famous uh, Rembrandts that are used often in comparison. One is very early Rembrandt. It's a tiny little figure and there's this, you can just see from the back, the canvas, and it's 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 huge, it's like a panel. And and he's got his his, his mouth stuck, you know, and his, his brushes and his, and his palette. And he's thinking about what, and, and it's like this intimidating thing. He's thinking about what to paint on this thing. And all these implements distance him from the surface of the painting, right? It's a brush. And, and that's one. And then there's a late Rembrandt, um, which is the opposite of this, a little bit like Wittgenstein. And it's a picture of him very close up. It's a portrait. And he's got the palette. He's got the mouse stroke. He's got the, the 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 brushes. And his hand is coming through the palette. And, and it doesn't, his hand just merges with it. His hands become the brushes and his hands become the, the palette. And it's like he's one with the work, you know. So um, if you're interested, I'll send you that picture. But uh, it, it really is that latter version that Rembrandt started to see that the making of the thing is the making of the self. That these things are not distinct. In uh, entrepreneurship, we teach this principle, the benefit of scarce resources. And I see that echoing through some of the examples that you shared, the breakfast nook, the fallout piece, the nano. And I'm wondering if that's a conscious part of what you uh, undertake and what you teach. No, <laughs> uh, but thank you for <laughs> suggesting maybe it should be. Um, well, I'm thinking of a constraint, like the breakfast nook had a constraint and that led to maybe not a wonderful outcome, but an interesting outcome. Yeah. The, the nano car had a constraint. It was, it had to be for a certain price. The piece of fallout had a artistic constraint. And I think, again, that to me strikes me as the principle of a scarce resource. And if you didn't have that constraint, I think you might not have had, you, you definitely wouldn't have had the same kind of outcome. Yeah, that's a good point. So I'm wondering if it's different language, but a similar kind of principle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it might might be different language. So it's a really good point. Um, I, I often use the word friction. Um, the, the, there's kind of friction in these processes, which is productive and you know, it's heat producing, it's idea producing. It produces the work because um, exactly as you said, there are conditions that you have to bump up against and deal deal with. Um, so yeah, uh, it's it's also um, the nano is, is you know, a separate lecture all onto itself because what you're describing was applied to every screw in that. So the constraint wasn't the, 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 the big mission statement. The constraint was at every single step of the design process. It was interrogated right down to the crash testing of it. So they developed the first software to crash test a vehicle remotely or virtually virtually. Um, so it, it, yes, massive constraints produced massive innovation in, in that case that would, I think, speak to, to, to the kind of um, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit, but also the innovative spirit that uh, resource scarcity can produce. Yeah. Thank you so much for your talk, Anita and Esther. Um, I work at the Watson Institute. I serve on the um, SAC committee with my colleagues, Michael and Sarah, and also serve um, on the Art at Watson oh, yeah. committee. Um, so we are engaging in bringing public art into our sphere and um, consistently looking for ways to link the art that we bring in with um, the faculty and, and engaging with the faculty and exposing the pieces of art to, to our students, um, obviously. So I wonder just 
in your opinion, what are the, some of practical ways to tie those two together? Um, the pedagogical aspects of um, what's being taught in our classrooms as a social science discipline um, and the arts and, and really engaging the students um, in a meaningful way. So just like on the ground, what, what can we do um, to, to tie those two together? You, you want me to be practical, right? Yes. <laughs> Offer a BIA slash Watson course okay, taught by an artist and a social scientist um, and give them both a lot of leash and a lot of room to work in their expertise, but work together. Thank you. Let's talk. Can we that happen? <laughs> well, now the provost is leaving. So we'll have to <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you.